A writer named Earl Hamner once began a novel with this inscription. It is remembered in my family that on Christmas Eve of 1933, my father was late arriving home. That, along with the love he and my mother bestowed upon their eight red-headed offspring, is fact. The rest is fiction. You know, there are a couple of answers to where is reality. Uh, a lot of writers feel that if they write it, that makes it real. There is that reality. And I think that's where Earl's genius as a, writing, a writer comes in. I don't remember those things as he did. There is also the reality of the television family, uh, which I, and not just I, but a lot of writers and directors and producers and people had to do with, we, we created out of that real family, a fictitious family called the Waltons. The way we dealt with each other was part of what transcended the screen. And because we genuinely cared about each other and felt about each other like family. In my own case, there is the reality of a family named Hamner that lived in Schuyler, Virginia, and grew up during the Depression and had a large family. Uh, that, that is real. The Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia, a place where legends and folklore and tales of the past weave themselves through wooded glens. Wandering spirits, lingering and nurturing the imaginations of the people who inhabit these mountain hollows and hamlets. A gentle place where kindness and togetherness found a home. This is the setting where a young writer was raised this is the setting that a young writer wrote of, and it is the setting that 25 years ago stole America's heart. Schuyler, Virginia, the real Walton's Mountain, is a place that has become synonymous with family values, a place that seems to have found some sense of harmony. That sense of harmony translated to homes all over the world, as millions of viewers longed for the atmosphere of love and support and family that they saw in the Waltons. And in the world of Hollywood, where stories die as soon as they are born, Skyler's story lives on and continues to bind a group of actors into a loving family of its own. Skyler's history is rich with examples of love and support, but it is not without struggle. How did this atmosphere of love come to be? And can it still exist? Driving through this small, quiet community, it's hard to imagine a bustling city. But that is precisely the framework that shaped the character of Schuyler and its people, and set the foundation for one of America's most beloved television series. This mountaintop was a barely inhabited hamlet until the Alperine Stone Company moved in and began to create the bonds of unity that would make Schuyler famous was a guy from New York uh, with the name Dan Carroll. He was a geologist or something. Anyway, he's seen this big potential with this stone vein. And uh, they moved up here and up at Scala here and there. Some, sometime about 1920, I think. And then, uh, of course, they discovered a, a big vein right up here, right in Scala, right on top of the ground, it hard to get to. And they built this big plant over there. The town itself was owned by the, the company. It practically all the houses here, and the various little localities, like on Riverside Drive, now known as, and then Stump Town, and Gold Mine, those villages were Virtually everybody owned their own, I mean, the company owned all those places, all those homes. The Alberine Stone Company provided free electricity and water to more than 200 houses in Schuyler. The company also provided a workforce of electricians, carpenters, blacksmiths, and plumbers. But Alberine Stone didn't just maintain its houses. The company also cared about the welfare of its people. Mr. Carroll owned the quarry. And so his wife actually 
uh, she was a big philanthropist. And from what I understand, she wanted a hospital for the community. Okay. She was not a medical person, but when this uh, place was in action, she would come in here every single day and check every single room, every single patient. Earl Hamner Jr. and three more of his siblings were born in this house. This was a family place, a place where people came to be safe and secure and be taken care of just like the whole village. It reflect, the hospital was a miniature reflection of the goodness of the whole village. The goodness of this little village came from a feeling of familiarity, a kinship, because the plant was the place where virtually everyone in the community earned a living to provide for their families, a sense of responsibility for each other because of their constant interaction. I remember that at the the soapstone plant, a whistle would blow. Also, if you heard a series of whistles blowing, that meant there was a, a, an accident or help was needed, and so the men in the community, and sometimes the ladies as well, would rush to the center of the little village to uh, see if there was anything they could do. These were the kind of people who made Schuyler what it was, yeah. Primarily, it was a community of hardworking people that always had limits as far as money was concerned. We didn't have social workers or politicians coming in telling us how poor we were. Uh, so we didn't, we didn't think we were poor. And we were rich as far as family values are concerned. But for the majority of people here, it was really a difficult thing uh, to make ends meet day to day life. It is this lifestyle, bordering on material poverty, that the Waltons frequently depicted. The Depression-era Waltons were very much a family rich in love, but poor in pennies. People have said to me, How, you, you people seem so happy during the Depression. You, you seem to live so well. But, but we did live well, because we didn't need, I mean, we'd like to have had money, but um, we kept a cow. So we had butter and milk and buttermilk. And um, uh, we had pigs that we raised and slaughtered every year. We kept chickens, so we had fresh eggs. Uh, we had a vegetable garden, so we had fresh produce. We had a root cellar so where we kept apples and onions and um, squash all went along. So we were not hungry. And as a matter of fact, we ate rather well. I can remember my father going out and shooting Bob White quail uh, in the evening, and we would have them the next morning for breakfast. And, and that's high living. That's, that's good living. <laughs> Schuyler was a place where families were resourceful in taking care of themselves and taking care of each other. Even businesses were in the practice of sharing with their customers. Tillman's store was one of those businesses that took care of its own. The Tillman's always had, a, had a credit for everybody in the community. This was before credit cards were popular and uh, uh, each family had their own little charge account there, and I've often wondered if they didn't really probably feed a lot of people and were never paid for it. They never admitted to it. They're rather modest about that, but uh, I think that that probably happened a lot. The Tillman store, yeah, I remember when they used to run, Tillman used to run this store. Oh, it was a good place to go and, uh, yeah, and, and buy, uh, you know, a little uh, all you need, a good place to go and meet and talk to people and, and they had jukebox sometimes they had uh, dances there and uh, it, it, was, it was just good, it was a good place to go there and meet and just have a conversation with some of your friends you know and uh, they were nice people and talk to them. Martha and Elsie affectionately known as the Tillman girls used to run Tillman's store they often reminisce with friends about the good old days of the store, a building they can still see at the end of their road on Tillman Lane. Though the building has gone to ruin, Martha and Elsie say they can't bring themselves to tear it down, as much for the people who shared their lives there as for themselves. So it stands as a reminder of bygone days, as does this building that now houses Schuyler's only restaurant. 
has been a school there, uh, what is now a the restaurant called Scholar Restaurant is where I went to school. And that's the only school that I remember. I went there through the seventh grade. And then the Elizabeth Giannini is one of Schuyler's most beloved citizens. After one visit with her that may involve some iced tea and homemade pie, it isn't hard to see why she is so well loved. Everyone in town calls her Sis. Sis has lived in Schuyler for most of her life and she did attend school in the building that houses the restaurant. But she graduated in 1928 from the building next door, as did most of Schuyler's residents. And like those residents, Sis returns to the school at least once a year for events that seem more like family gatherings than high school reunions. It is a special place that holds memories for everyone, even Schuyler's most famous graduate. This whole building brings back a great many memories of being a boy here. In the next room next to this was my room from which I graduated in 1940. If you can believe anybody can still be alive who graduated in 1940. There was a graduation dance held here in the auditorium. I was desperately in love at the time with Miss Elsie Mayo, who she taught the seventh grade. Mostly my love took the form of ador adoring her from a distance, but I finally got to dance with her. The music was a song called Careless, and the words went, Careless, now that you've got me loving you. <laughs> I remember singing the words as we danced, but Miss Mayo didn't seem to notice. <laughs> I suppose she had no idea of the degree of my passion, <laughs> nor did she ever know how broken my heart was when she married the math teacher, Mr. T. Dan Gusmarati. <laughs> Most of the activities centered around your church, your school, your family, and Certainly when it came to the schools, the positive part was that the teachers lived in the community. They were not only active in the school, but were active in the community and as part of, of the overall life. They were all great teachers and wonderful people. They truly were. My first teacher was my dear mother. She taught me spiritual and practical values and gave me unlimited emotional support, and also the love of family. The love of family was something that all of Schuyler's sons and daughters grew up with. These bonds may have begun with the company mentality and caring teachers, but the Hamner family is quick to point out that it was their parents, Doris and Earl Hamner Sr., that strengthened those bonds and passed the idea of kindness down to their children. Fans of the Waltons know that parents John and Olivia taught their children to live by the golden rule, to treat each other with the same respect that they would expect for themselves. Though some aspects of the Waltons were exaggerated for dramatic purposes, many characterizations were true to life. Like Olivia Walton, Doris Hamner was a kind, God-fearing woman from a Baptist background. She always wanted the best for her children. Like John Walton, Earl Hamner Sr. was a character who loved a good time. He proudly called his children his thoroughbreds and bragged about them often. Doris and Earl were an odd match in the beginning, a match that made Doris's mother a bit skeptical. The last person in the world that she would have selected as a suitor for her 16-year-old daughter was my father. He was 20 at the time, a known carouser, a, gam a crack shot, and benefiting his Welsh ancestry, he was a singer of note. He thought nothing of going hunting on Sunday, and even worse, when he defiled the Lord's Day by fishing, he had to go right past the Baptist church to get to the Rockfish River. In the church, they'd be singing, shall we gather at the river, and my father would go past and nod. He was quite a character. We he was a cat bird, as we always say. And I mean, but he was an honest man. And I heard him say one time that he attributed his success and everything to his wife because 
said if he hadn't turned over about 90% of his paycheck to her every week or twice a month when they used to get paid, that she managed the money because he would throw it away, in which he probably would. But if he told you he'd do something, he'd do it, and he would do you a favor as quick as anybody. He mended his ways, he got himself baptized, joined the church, and said goodbye to some of his fast friends. They had 45 years together. They had eight children. And at night, before we went to sleep, we would all say goodnight to each other. And to his dying day, he called my mother sweetheart. Of course, my mother was a fantastic person, and how she managed to do everything that she did, I'll never know. Uh, she was a very uh, loving person. Uh, she was a very strict person, uh, particularly strict on, on her children. Um, we were usually not allowed to leave the yard until we were like 16 years old. <laughs> I remember my mother sending us off to school at 9 o'clock, and we would all come back at 12 for lunch. And I would hate to think that I had eight kids arriving for lunch after just sending them off at, at 9. Doris and Earl Sr. raised their eight Hamner children just across the road from their school, in this white house. Earl Jr. was the oldest, followed by Cliff, Marion, Audrey, Paul, Bill, Jim, and Nancy. In the Waltons, there were only seven children. Paul and Bill Hamner were combined into the character of Ben Walton. It made for a better TV story. But in reality, each Hamner child had a personality all their own. I even drew pictures of Earl. Uh, he used to do this thing with his hair where he'd run his hands through his hair. And I drew a picture of him doing that one day and put it on his door. And I don't think he enjoyed that one. <laughs> <laughs> My brother Cliff was a draftsman. And he and I were the closest in age. And so we were always great buddies. We got into a lot of trouble together. <laughs> We, uh, Any stories you can tell on Well, uh, yeah, like we would make corn silk cigarettes and smoke them. And that was a, a real taboo. <laughs> you yeah. were not to do that. And one time I remember singeing off all my eyebrows doing that, uh, lighting a corn silk cigarette. My uh, sister Audrey, who we always call her the pretty one. She is a pretty woman. And uh, she liked to stay inside and help with my, help my mother with housework. I hated it. And I still don't like it, but I do it. Uh, but um, Audrey loved to cook. And it's a good thing she did because she had five children. And she's had to do a lot of cooking. Next is my brother, Paul. And Paul is a saint. If there's a saint in the family, it has to be my brother, Paul. He is so good. He would give his life for any of us, I'm sure, as we would for him. But he, he would express it. If, if you want my right arm, here it is. He's a good person. And then there's my brother Bill, who's deceased. And uh, Bill was a hard-working man. He, was, um, he worked construction work all his life. And uh, he died of uh, lung complications. Mm -hmm. And that was very sad for us, because he was so young. Mm -hmm. But um, he had a chronic pulmonary lung disease, mm -hmm. is what he had. And uh, anyway, he, he's still in our memories each day. Uh, next came my brother Jim, and Jim uh, was always a doer. He's always so reliable. He's there if we need him now. I think about how he helped my mother when she was so ill. He was there when my father died. He was there when both my brothers died. And, he, you know, he, he just takes over. And you need somebody like that in the family. Talking about saints, now Jim is the saint because he's the one who stayed with my mother and took such great care of her and stood by her while you know we were here in Richmond and not that close to home to be with him and help him out as much as we should have. But he just, he is a saint and he will go to heaven one day for the way he took care of my mother, really. Mm -hmm. Our mother, yeah. He's the saint in the family. <laughs> and the youngest is Nancy. And she will tell you, first of all, how spoiled she is. And she really is. But it was a pleasure spoiling her because I was so much, I was 10 years older than Nancy. So having a, a child to play with, a baby to play with when you're 10 is wonderful. I remember one time I dyed Jim's hair red because 
because he didn't have red hair, and all the rest of us did. So I, I thought he should have red hair, too. <laughs> okay, what did you think about that? <laughs> well, I think Mama made us wash it out. <laughs> She's really spoiled, and I, I, I blame myself for a lot of that. And because um, we, we spoiled her rotten, and uh, my brother Paul uh, used to pick her up upstairs out of bed when she was you know, seven or eight years old, and every morning he would pick her up and bring her down, wouldn't let her walk down the steps. <laughs> so she's definitely spoiled. I know. I'm surprised I can walk. <laughs> Paul did. Every morning he would come by my room and pick, get me out of bed and carry me downstairs to the kitchen, <laughs> or to the bathroom, and then to the kitchen. And he would never let me cross the road to go to school until he, I, he was there to make sure he would hold my hand and walk me across the road. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was overly protective of me. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. Is that true? And I uh, worried myself about everybody, and I'd always walk her across the road here to the school. I'd be there to watch her, and uh, oh, it annoyed her. <laughs> oh, I think when I was growing up with, with um, my brothers and sisters, and being a part of that family, I realize now how lucky I was um, to have been born in that clan. <laughs> the Hamner clan was a mirror image of the caring and companionship that enveloped the entire village of Schuyler. Each family with its own character, each deeply connected to the other, when one was in need, the others rallied. Though the Depression era deprived many families, there was perhaps no greater sense of loss than that that surrounded World War II. It was a time of uncertainty that brought tragedy to several families in Schuyler, tragedy that remains an open wound some 50 years later. When the war, World War II broke out, I never saw anything to equal this, the people knitting together to cry together, pray together, to sing and laugh together. But that was a time when it was a hurting time for all of us. Having known all of these people as you grew up, uh, it became very, very personal when there was a loss or if, if they were wounded. Uh, it was almost as if a member of your own family had been had been killed or wounded, uh, simply because everybody knew everybody else. These wars gave a special and tragic meaning to our parents' generation. Having fought for their country, having given their sons and daughters to their country, I think we came to appreciate the deeper meaning of love of country, of honor, and of sacrifice. War had another influence on it. It took many of us away to big cities when we had never even been in, in big American cities. And it brought us home with a deeper appreciation of Nelson County. Though the Hamner boys came home with a deep appreciation for the Blue Ridge Mountains, it would not be long before they would leave to find a life of their own. And Earl would be the first. He loved his family. He cherished his upbringing. But his curiosity and his passion for writing called to him from the world outside of his mountain home. Earl began his career in New York City by writing for NBC Radio. During that time, he published his first novel, Fifty Roads to Town. He followed it with several other novels and a move to Hollywood, where he wrote the film adaptation of the popular children's book, Charlotte's Web. He also began to write for television, and his Schuyler background, deeply grounded in his memory, began to play itself out in his work. Yeah, but even, but even um, um, on something as uh, different from uh, Schuyler as the Twilight Zone, I did a couple of Twilight Zones that were immediately rooted in the Schuyler tradition, in stories. I remember one, the first Twilight Zone I ever wrote was about an old man who was on a coon hunt and uh, he, he died that night, he drowned, and when he woke up the next morning, he was in heaven. 
and uh, they, he'd taken his dog with him. I mean, that's a very brief retelling of the story, but it was rooted in Schuyler. Earl wrote for the first time about his own family in a book called Spencer's Mountain. It soon became a major motion picture starring Henry Fonda and Maureen O'Hara. The film was highly acclaimed as a moving portrait of a loving family. Earl had also written a shorter novel called The Homecoming that was again based on the trials and tribulations of his family. It was made into a television movie that starred Patricia Neal as Olivia Walton, Edgar Bergman as John Walton, and for the first time, audiences were introduced to the introspective, protective older brother known as John Boy and his six younger siblings. The young actors who played the Walton children had no idea what this one TV movie would lead to. And at that point, 1971, there hadn't been a whole lot of TV movies. There had been a few, and, uh, and a few of them had gone on to be series. And I remember saying, oh, you know, this could be really great because this could end up being a series. That's what they're doing these days. And, you know, who knew? My parents, I don't think, had any idea what was to come of this audition. My mom was very happy. My mom and I jumped up and down in the kitchen because she was so excited, and I was trying to understand why. <laughs> That's right, you're thinking, hmm, okay. But to me, it meant, oh, we get to go to Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and I get to get a new coat. So that was the most exciting part for me. <laughs> the homecoming experience is documented six ways from Sunday by my parents, their home movies, because they thought this was one off. We'd do this, and that'd be the end of it. Um, and they were going to show us all exciting and this special thing that I was doing, and then to be done. The homecoming was well received by audiences across America. Not long after its premiere, Earl was approached about doing a series based on the story, but not entirely because of the story's success. The network saw the Waltons as an easy solution to a sticky situation. It was a time when um, the networks were under attack by uh, Senator Pastore, and uh, because there was a lot of violence, there was endless murders, uh, slimy talk shows, uh, television what should have been at change of itself. I mean, there's good stuff, but predominantly the stuff was just awful. And the networks needed to show that they could do something that had some value. So they put us on expecting it to last a couple of days. When the show first came out, we were against Flip Wilson and the Mod Squad, which were the coolest shows on. And they were my parents watched Flip Wilson. I remember that. I remember getting together Thursday nights at 8, Flip Wilson. Um, and it was very cool. Uh, and the story was that CBS put together this family program to silence the critics who were moaning about the lack of quality television. And they'd put it in this death slot, and it would fail, and they wouldn't have to do it again. So it was almost this, so there, you know. We don't have to do any more family shows because nobody watches them. We said they wouldn't, and they didn't. Our producer, Lee Rich, had, I think, a brilliant idea. He took out ads in the newspapers that said, save the Waltons. If you want to, uh, to keep this kind of family programming on the air, call CBS, write to CBS, and, and tune in on Thursday night. And people did. So in a very short time, we were the number one show. The sense of community and family found on Walton's Mountain made the show famous. But what made it real to the viewers was that Walton's Mountain was not a fairy tale land where all stories had happy endings. And being labeled as a show with good family values occasionally made people lose sight of the diversity and richness in the characters that Hamner created and the stories that he told. The show's often touted as a show about m moral values and decency and blah, 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 blah. And it, and it does have that. But it, it also shows human frailties and it dealt with a lot of issues, uh, racism and uh, book burning and jealousy between the kids and, you know, very human stuff, which I think is universal and which um, people relate to on a very deep level. Well, I think that's what the show was really about in a nutshell. It was a family who were able to survive because of the fact 
that they loved each other, they worked together, they had good communication with each other, and they got through these problems, either problems from the outside or problems within the family. They were able to overcome them. One of the, um, one of the interesting things about the Waltons, I found, is that it speaks to people no matter what their background or interests are. I, I, I was at a retirement dinner at Warner Brothers once, and I was sitting next to a woman I'd never met before. She was a uh, set designer, and she said, I'm very glad to know you because uh, that show reminds me so much of the way I grew up. And I said, oh, did, were, you, were you Virginian? Were you from the South? And she said, Lord, no, I uh, grew up in a Jewish ghetto in Pennsylvania, in Pittsburgh. <laughs> but yet this, the show spoke to me, she said. So I think we, we hit a universal chord of, um, of understanding, of experience, and, and yearning. I think it came at a time in America where there was a division in the country and people wanted to unite together. I think it still comes in a time in America where people want a sense of family and a sense of brotherhood of mankind that's missing. And I think Earl Hamner created a place for that to happen. Earl Hamner created a place where viewers could find a sense of brotherhood. It was the same sense of brotherhood that he himself grew up with. A sense of brotherhood so strong that it followed him onto the set of the Waltons and turned a group of Hollywood actors into a family. And not just on the screen. For these actors, the Waltons became much more than just another job. It transformed my life, really. I mean, I was going through a personal heartache time with a divorce from the father of my children. and I had no money. Um, and it was like a gift from heaven, you know, to, to be able to work and stay in one place for eight years and raise my kids. And there, there are no words to describe what it's been like to be part of the Walton family. And everybody always asks, what is it like? Do you really like each other? Do you really get along? And I just tell them, no, we actually never met. They did it all with mirrors. <laughs> we spent a lot of time together. You know, we were frequently at work eight hours. Um, and then we were all in school together. So we probably spent more time together than most siblings do. And a lot of the regular siblings, I mean, I got teased and spoiled and all, this, all the things that the youngest gets. Um, and then I'd go home and do it all to my brother. Uh, right. Now I know really how to pick on people. Because originally when I was 15 and say Mary Elizabeth, uh, Mary McDonough, who was, I think, 12 or something at the time. 12 and 15, there's a lot of difference between that. Um, and, or, you know, but by the time you get to, you know, 23 and 20, it's not that different. Um, or now, or, <laughs> 103 and 100. <laughs> it really is a family. I mean, these kids who are now adults, and Ralph, who's a dear love of mine, uh, I mean, I almost feel like I am married to him, and that these are my children, and that, that this is part of my extended family. And I think that only comes from doing a show for as long as we did it, and watching those children grow up. I mean, literally, Cammie was six years old when the show started, and was 16 when the show was over. So, I mean, on my refrigerator at home, I have pictures of my children's children, and my Walton's children's children, and um, that's a pretty special thing. What Earl Hamner and the Waltons created was carving out a niche for itself, in the hearts of the actors, in the hearts of the viewers, and in the pages of television history. It was an Emmy Award-winning program, and it ran for nine seasons in prime time. But while the Waltons were creating a sense of unity and brotherhood in homes across the country, the town where their stories were born, where Earl Hamner had cherished his family and community, his own real place of unity was falling apart. The once vibrant village of love and kinship was losing the very things that bound its people together. The soapstone plant, the foundation of Schuyler's heritage, was breathing its last breaths. The soapstone plant started declining in around 69 or 70 because 
the sales office for the soapstone plant was in New York. But they were paying them a good piece of money, and they got greedy, so they thought they'd cut that office out. And sure enough, they did cut it out. Well, it went on. We, we made it through the 60s and, and in 19 and 1972, I believe it was, is when they shut it down. They shut the plant down. The, the town was devastated by that. Most people had to find work outside of Schuyler. Um, businesses that had existed there had to close down. Uh, I think there was a hotel at one time, there was a movie theater at one time, there were other stores other than the ones that exist now. Uh, they all had to go out of business. It took place over a long period of time. It didn't just happen like one day you woke up and there was no business left. Uh, it, it happened over maybe 15 years, maybe longer than that. But it, it definitely happened, and it definitely left Schuyler in, in fairly dire straits. So the school was the only thing that was left there that was holding that community together, aside from the churches. The school was not just the place where Schuyler's children learned. It was not just a landmark of the community. Schuyler Elementary School was a place for socialization, a place for dances and dinners and meetings and gatherings. With the soapstone plant virtually non-existent, the school became one of the only places that kept the community united, connected to one another. But in 1990, a chain of events began that would test the bonds of this community perhaps more than ever before. The Nelson County School Board decided that it was time for Schuyler Elementary School to close. They fought hard and long in 1990 to keep their school open. This was a focal point of the community, as you can imagine. So they, f they didn't want their children on these country roads bused. I mean, our children are now one hour on a bus mm -hmm. where they walked across the street. Mm -hmm. You know, so they fought hard and long to keep their school here. Mm -hmm. There was 110 students in the county, just didn't see the economics in that. Mm -hmm. It was graduation, the last graduation. Everybody was there. People were crying, children were crying. It basically felt like a, like everybody felt like a, like mama and papa all left, orphaned. And the whole of Schuyler felt orphaned because the school to them was mama and papa. People at that point did not know what else is going to happen. So basically, they became very emotional about it because it wasn't just closing down the school, it was closing down the last vestige of the old and lively Schuyler. I tried my best to tell the people in Schuyler that, that the school was not lost, that, that they could continue to use it. And some people picked up that on that idea and began planning the community center and they began holding dances um, and other events that were designed to raise money for it. As it happened, that's about the same time that I figured out maybe this could be a museum. Woody thought that by opening a museum, the community could find a steady income to maintain its community center. With Earl Hamner's blessing, Woody applied for a state grant to fund the initial costs of converting the school into a museum. The grant was approved, and Earl himself donated seed money to the project. With Robert Hollis, curator and decorator, the process of creating the Walton's Mountain Museum got underway. Suddenly, the town that spawned the Waltons was hoping that the program's popularity would bring Schuyler back to life. But what if the museum failed? The pressure and uncertainty in that one single hope almost proved too much. Schuyler's historical sense of unity began to falter. Feelings were hurt. Motives were questioned. It was as if people forgot that they were working toward a common goal. They began to suspect each other, and Woody's hope of saving Schuyler's unity was beginning to fade. I did some things to get that museum going that I'm very proud of. But the actual physical labor, I didn't do very much at all. The physical labor was done by people like Larry Hugo and Robert Brent Hall and dozens of other people that I don't even remember the names of anymore. Uh, and Bill Lures played a very important part in that. But there was a tension there. 
part of it was because I was active member of county government and there was a certain amount of suspicion about county government and government officials wanting to run things for, for maybe self-serving purposes and things like that. Um, and it's hard to convince people that you're not there for that, that purpose. To a certain extent, something in the community of Schuyler, something in the hearts of its people, died the day that the school was closed. This was a community that depended on each other, that trusted in life and in fate. Somehow, in the closing of that school, Schuyler felt betrayed. The people felt a sense of uncertainty that had been foreign to them. But ironically, it was the presence of the TV Waltons, the people that were created by that very sense of unity, that began the process of emotionally rebuilding. I had been out the day before because they had opened for the press the day before. The cast members were here, and I had come out for that and then to do some final touches. Uh, for opening day. Uh, I came out early uh, for opening day uh, and of course they had blocked off the road down to the mill. Uh, I was let through to come up this way but when I drove up and saw nothing but a mass of people uh, as far as you could see every inch of space was covered with people. I think they said it was about 6,000 people here. I neither before in a sense I've ever seen that many people in Scala. It was just body to body people. I don't know where they even parked cars. I mean, it was just head to head. You just saw a sea of people, joyful people. Everybody had a smile. They all were smiling. I think that was the moment for me the realization that this is truly a success story. The downtrodden Skyler is a winner. They got something that no one else does. I believe that sentiment was carried through by all the people. On that one fall day in 1992, the people of Schuyler were reminded of their heritage, of their caring for one another, of what made them a community. Opening day was a success. The museum has become a success. And though the healing process has been a long one, unity is returning once again to this mountain village. Not only does the museum draw close to 40,000 visitors a year to this small community, but it also funds community projects Every profit from the museum is plowed back into the community. The building has become a focal point once again. Though it houses much Walton memorabilia, the museum is also a testament to the history of Schuyler and the legacy of its ancestors. It is dedicated not to a television series, but to the memory of a mother and father, Doris and Earl Hamner Sr. We are here today to honor my mother and father but in so doing, I would like to honor all the mothers and fathers of their generation, especially those families of Schuyler who have come such a long distance in Schuyler's history. There is a, pa a plaque that is going to remind people whenever they come here of my mother and father. And uh, whenever people from Schuyler who, and I hope I've mentioned as many Schuyler families as I could remember, uh, I hope when they come here, they will accept this plaque as honoring them as well, all those parents of my parents' generation. For Earl and his brothers and sisters, their parents must live on only in their hearts. Doris and Earl Sr. are both deceased. Sadly, Earl Sr. passed away in 1969, before the homecoming premiered on television. Doris died in 1990. The Hamner family circle that sustained them and encouraged them through their hardships was broken and the two strongest links were gone. Even today, with lives of their own that have taken them beyond the place of their birth, the Hamner siblings are still very emotional about the loss of their parents. Um, in Spencer's Mountain, 
uh, when that family is, is all gathered around the table, that just breaks my heart because we're not around that table anymore. Yeah. Um, in, um, um, in the Waltons, when Earl says goodnight, you know, at the end of the show, I break up. <laughs> I lose it right there. Because uh, you remember that's how it mm -hmm. used to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I, I'm sorry I'm getting emotional now, but that's the way it goes. Yeah. My father used to um, love this one song. It's a Baptist song called In the Garden. And he loved to sing it. And we all sang that at um, all the times we would get together. Mm -hmm. And when my father died, uh, my, one of my, my sister Marin, I think it was, because I, I had made the funeral arrangements. And she said, if anyone sings at Daddy's funeral, please don't let them sing in the garden. <laughs> oh. Yeah, that would have been tough to hear. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'm just sorry I didn't um, tell my mother and father I appreciated them and love them so much and mm. didn't do it when I could. Yeah. But not to get heavy or anything. Yeah. But, uh, they wouldn't want to be remembered as the role models for uh, <laughs> Olivia and John Walton, but I think they would want to be remembered as, say, Earl Hamner was the guy who would bring his neighbors fish or give you wood, and uh, Doris Hamner is the person who would give you butter and buttermilk or eggs or whatever the case may be. And that's what they would rather be remembered as, just good, good neighbors and good, warm, loving people. Doris Hamner was very proud of her children, all of her children, she was herself a big fan of the Waltons, and before there was a Walton's Mountain Museum to entertain curious visitors, Doris herself had been an ambassador of sorts in Schuyler, welcoming and entertaining the people who came in search of the Walton's origin. She would tell me stories about how many people were coming down to, to see her. She'd have to invite them in. She felt compelled to because she was such a nice lady. And uh, I think she probably ran out of tea at times <laughs> because she was inviting all these folks in. I remember um, uh, being home once, and um, uh, Jimmy Carter's mother, Lillian, was visiting Skyler. After Mrs. Carter left, I said to my mother, what did you all talk about? Because they had spent a long time talking together in the living room. And I said, Mama, what did you all talk about? She said, oh, we talked about our children. <laughs> the sense of kindness and gentility that Doris Hamner gave to her visitors is the same one that made Walton's Mountain famous. For years, people have come to Schuyler in search of Walton's Mountain, seemingly in search of a place where those qualities really exist. We had family values, and, and that's what this is all about. And, a lot, and the people who see it on television and come here and see this community, I, I, I think it's good for our country to see that this really did exist. It was under a different name. It was under Hamner rather than Walton, but uh, that family was here, and that family uh, persevered through tough times and did well. If I had to pick one thing that I would want people to remember about the Waltons, uh, about all of us who were associated with it, the writers, the directors, the actors, any one of us, I think, it would be that uh, so-called ordinary people are capable of extraordinary things. Uh, I, I, I don't think there's such a thing as the, the, the ordinary people. I think we are all extraordinary in some way. And I think that what the Waltons did and continues to do is to celebrate the nobility that is inherent in the ordinary person. You know, during the uh, Bush versus Clinton election, Bush said a couple of times in speeches, once to the Association of Religious Broadcasters, uh, we need fewer shows like The Simpsons and more like The Waltons. That made sound bites all over the nation. Um, the fact that Bush could use that in the context of a presidential election shows you the extent to which the values that the Waltons and Earl Hamner personify have become a part of our culture. 25 years after its initial airing, thousands of people come to Schuyler every year to discover the reality behind Earl Hamner's story. 
There is a spirit among these visitors, among the fan club members, among the actors themselves, a spirit of camaraderie and a family that would bring them together several times in 1997 to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the airing of the Waltons. But it's more than an anniversary party. It is almost a communion. And meeting these people, you feel welcomed into a circle that feels almost like home, a place of laughter and love and familiarity, a circle of warmth and magic, born and nurtured in a small town in the Blue Ridge Mountains, where the spirit of camaraderie has traveled through struggle and conflict to once again find a home. The thing that I love about what has happened to Skyla is that it is a terrific example of what can be still be done today in small towns. Uh, small towns are being depleted. Young people are moving away, and in many cases, older people are moving from their homes. And in, when this happens, I think we are losing something. But Skyla, to me, is a great example of what you can do to take the facilities, the, uh, what you have at hand, and to make something of it. And I, I mean, I suppose you have to make your community wherever you are as best you can. And there's no question you need help and support. I mean, I have a brand new baby, and that's the hardest thing I've ever done. But I think you need help. Ideally, you have help. And that's certainly what the Waltons had. And neighbors who would help. And I, there's a way to do that, and it happens in cities. It happens in churches and cities. And I, I think the whole values things, it, maybe it's not so much about you know, being a churchgoer as having a place to go where there are people who understand you and who will help you. The small towns are the, are the, the breeding ground <laughs> and the, uh, the, the refuge of, of uh, family values. Um, I, I think that um, that's a shame. I, I, uh, and, and more than a shame, uh, it, the, the family is the basic unit by which civilization survives. The, the, the family uh, provides ritual and a place to learn and a place where we get a sense of history. We know who we are and, um, and strength in time of, of distress and trial. I, I think that there is a, is a repository of these values in small towns like Skyler. And someday we, someday we may have to clone them like sheep. Something does not have to be big to be meaningful. And, and, and I think in worshiping bigness, we, we lose a lot of what makes us human. The, the small things of life, the gentle things, the Waltons. <laughs> the Waltons made their life on Walton's Mountain a special atmosphere, a place of warmth and magic created in a real family named Hamner, in a real mountain hamlet called Skylar. And while you can't help but feel the uniqueness of this place and these people, there is also a sense of hope that perhaps we can all have that kind of atmosphere, no matter where we live, and it's just a matter of finding it in our own hometowns, our own neighborhoods, our own apartment buildings, and our own families, where we write our own stories of love and laughter. And like the people of Schuyler, and like Doris and Earl Hamner, leave our children a Walton legacy.
production of this program has been made possible in part by a grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the National Educational Telecommunications Association. For a videotape copy of The Walton Legacy, send 2995 to WVPT 298 Port Republic Road, Harrisonburg, Virginia 22801 or call 540 434-5391.